So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is EJ McComb. I'm with Digicom. And uh, we thank you for attending this second session, Troubleshooting VoIP. Uh, this is, of course, session two. So two weeks ago, we talked about um, the various different elements that make up a VoIP network. And we talked about, at a very high level, about uh, troubleshooting it um, sort of at the, at the informational stage. So collecting information and so forth. What, uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, I would like to take it to the next step. So I would like to, uh, to take the stuff that we talked about in the first session and bring it into this session so, so that we can speak in more specific terms. Now, this isn't exactly a session on how to use each individual tool. Um, again, I wish it was, but you take a tool like Wireshark, for example, and there's so much to it that you could probably spend several days uh, in a class learning how to use that one tool. So I'll talk at a high level about the tools and I'll show you the tools and uh, some of the physical tools that we can use for troubleshooting and then uh, explain to you how they would be used um, as part of the process. And, uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully that gives you enough to take away. Now, one thing that I do have noted is that for a future session, I believe we will uh, make a session on um, setting your network up for success. So sort of best practices in VoIP. Obviously, what I'm reflecting to you are also best practices, but, but it's not exactly a session on how to set things up properly in the first place. Okay, so, so we'll begin. So our, our mission for today, a little bit different than last time, this I took directly out of my last slide deck. So it's to dig deeper and to look at some of the tools and tricks that will help us troubleshoot VoIP. Okay, so I want you to learn here how to rule out components and how to rule in components. They are flip side of each other, honestly. As long as you know one, then you know the other. And then uh, lastly, I want to look at some tools for, for VoIP uh, troubleshooting. So what I want to do is, uh, you know, sort of get all this information out in the next 15 minutes or 20 minutes max. And then the next 10 minutes after that, I want to show you sort of how my mind works uh, and my approach works um, in general. So I want to run you through uh, a scenario that we'll make up on the fly. And, uh, and look at you know, where we would go at each different step of the way. And, uh, and so I hope that that's gonna have some value to you. Maybe we can run through a couple scenarios if we have the time. Okay, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, let me do this. Um, let me just uh, take a quick uh, poll here. Well, not really even a poll. Just type in the chat screen again, if you will, please. Uh, let me know that you can see me and that you can hear, uh, sorry, you can see the screen. And that you can uh, you can hear me. I just want to be 100% sure. And the chat window says all good. Thank you. So one uh, one problem with not having a buddy, the buddy system, having somebody here to make sure. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay. So where to get started? So I got thinking about this, and I'm not going to lie to you. This deck may be several hours old now, so not not much older. Um, I was thinking to myself, honestly, where do you start with this? Same as the last time around. Given one hour to talk about such a huge topic, where do I even start with sort of part two? And I thought, you know, honestly, if somebody was explaining it to me, I guess I would want to know specifically what it is that I should do um, sort of in order. Like I've got a problem now. People have come to me. They knocked on my door or giving me a call and they've complained about it. Um, where, where do you start from there? Where exactly? So the first thing I would do is create a diagram. We talked about it in the last one and I've improved the diagram a little bit to give you an idea of what I would put into the diagram. Um, last time it was very high level, but if I was troubleshooting your network or my network for that matter, it wasn't good enough. It didn't have IP addresses in it. It didn't have subnets. It didn't talk about VLANs. It just had pictures of lines connecting to clouds. And that's great, but it's not specific enough to help me apply any tools to it. Okay, so I said as detailed as you can get and kind of semi-physical, semi-logical. So again, the clouds are nice. There's nothing wrong with them. But then um, let's talk about physically how things are connected. So if we've got a number of switches, for example, in a distribution closet that are connected to each other, that's really important. Like that, It might seem like a small detail, but it's a really big detail if it turns out that one of those, those distribution switches, for example, is affecting the experience of all the access uh, layer switches. If we don't draw the picture properly, um, sort of like a little tree in that case, a little pine tree, I suppose it would look like the way it would trickle down. Then, then we really aren't uh, troubleshooting the problem uh, thoroughly. So I also said I would collect pertinent user info. And this again, I said last time, and I'm going to very quickly 
re reiterate the details that I personally collect from people. So I, I want to take it a step further though. Work as a team with your end users, right? Because they're the most important part of the equation. Not only are they the ones complaining, so you want to satisfy them, but they're also the, the only people who can uh, validate these problems happening. So we really want to work with them as a team. I sit down and, and ask people, I ask customers if they can kindly give me the busiest person in the office, the person who's most likely to have the problem and let me win those, you know, those people over and work with them uh, to figure it out. I'm really not interested in the most helpful person in the office because they may not be busy on the phone. So I really want people who are busy on the phone and uh, really want to win them over. Okay, so we collect info on that. And as soon as you start that, it's, that's an offline process that's being done by somebody else. So it's fantastic. They're collecting details and they're sending it to you by email once a day or whatever the case may be. And you can work on your diagram, right? You can work on other things. The third thing I figured was collect info from any devices on the network. And I'm actually surprised about um, how many times our technicians fail uh, to take a look at that as well. So you say, have you talked to the client, for example, about SNMP traps or, or um, any sort of network monitoring software they have? And of course, you know, I, I think it's our, our intuition to look at some of these things as black boxes, but we can't just say switch is good or bad. Um, those switches in a lot of cases have management software. A lot of them have management uh, interfaces. Um, and a lot of them speak to SNMP trapping applications and so forth. Maybe somebody's got some of that info. Also, what about the phone system? The phone system has lots of info. Very few systems that don't. So, um, so can the phone system itself tell me that certain stations are having problems? In the case of a number of the ones that Digicom carries, absolutely. So again, that's one of the first things that I want to take a look at. So the user says there's a problem, absolutely, and I believe them. But if the phone system then can corroborate that, now I've got even more evidence. And then draw a circle. So this is the last step. Draw a circle on the diagram. We talked about it super briefly last time, but I want to get into it this time. This is really what it's all about. That encompasses all the components that could be involved uh, with the problem. Okay, so it's a huge, huge circle at first. And then we'll use rule in, rule out to define the actual problem. All right, so really simple. Four steps here is what I'm recommending. Yes, they're big, but the four steps is what I'm recommending. And this will get you down to very few um, components that could be causing the problem. From there on, there's, there's more to it, of course, but that will get us down to the root of the issue. I want to remind you very quickly, components of a VoIP call. Um, so this is from session one. So from the desk phone to the PSTN, we got a network cable, building wiring, network switch, router gateway, out now to the modem, out to the internet, then into, and this is the case, this is just one scenario in which we're talking about a SIP trunk, right? If this was a, a PRI going into your system and you have a bunch of IP phones, it, it, the, the list would actually look kind of different. <laughs> it would say network cable, building wiring, network switch, the router gateway we wouldn't uh, care about, we would talk about a core switch or something maybe, and then the phone system itself, right? And so the phone system has a thing that acts like a modem inside it called a voice compression module, and it does some work. So we might draw that into the picture. So the picture would look a little bit differently, but all I want you to do is consider all the little pieces. And this isn't to overwhelm you, this is just to be realistic. I really want to test all those individual pieces. Okay, now here's collect info network diagram. So this is a different network diagram. And I, I drew this one out so that in our fictitious scenarios in a few minutes, we can come back to this diagram and kind of uh, begin to circle things on it. So I made some things up course, uh, about each different uh, surrounding. So the remote office here, for example. So, so we've got info about the one site, info about the main site here. And so this is discussing specifically, really for the most part, the IP structure on these components. And this one's talking about these guys. So initially, of course, when a customer calls in, and again, we'll come back to this, but when a, when a uh, customer calls in uh, or a person comes to you, they just simply say, I had a phone call and it was bad. And you say, <laughs> has it only happened once or does this happen all the time? And they say, oh, it happens frequently enough that I'm bothering you. You think, oh shoot, something for me to look at. So of course, the drawing the circle method sees that pretty much this entire piece, and this isn't the case, for example, where you don't have IP lines, this entire piece of the puzzle is in the, is in the picture as long as it's a, say, a remote office worker. If it's a main site worker, then it's a little bit different. The circle's smaller to begin with. But this is the kind of troubleshooting that we're gonna do in two seconds.
And now back to collecting info. So remember we talked again, I don't want to reiterate what we've talked about already, but I do want to just sort of jog your memory. So collect some user info. This is the format that I use. Sometimes I ask for more details, sometimes fewer. It really depends on um, how helpful and how busy the person is who's helping. At the end of the day, I don't want to burden them with too many details, but at the same time, if you only give me part of these details and not all of them, then it actually means nothing. You may as well not help out at all. So <clears throat> what happened? When did it happen? Who did it happen to? Like who were the two parties in the phone call? Even if it was an auto tenant on the other side, if the problem was, gosh, I called XYZ company at this phone number and I pressed some digits in on my phone and the auto tenant didn't understand me, that's a legit problem. So again, describe that. But on the other end of the, of the phone call, there was a phone number, right? So at the very least, give me your extension, your name, whatever the case is, what phone you were sitting at is what I'm getting at. And then what number did you call? And from there, I can go backwards. I can research the phone system to see how did it get to that phone number? That phone number right there, that 416 phone number. Does it use our PRI to get there? Because that would eliminate our VoIP trunks. Does it use VoIP trunks to get there? Then gosh, we've got a, um, an IP station talking to the phone system, then talking at an IP line. Lots of places for problems to happen. I've got a big circle and I've got lots to look at. But again, I need this level of detail or I really can't, um, uh, I can't make an educated um, start. Okay. So let's talk about collecting info from the network. So we talked about, uh, as we said before, drawing a diagram, number one, collecting user info. Number two, which like I said, very simple, come up with something like this. Ask me if you'd like, I've got, I'm sure I've got emails around. Um, collect info from devices on the network. So this is, gosh, does the person have SNMP or syslog traps enabled, right? So all these systems, if you're not familiar with those, those are really simple protocols where the device itself sends out information to a listening device. So lots of things support it, like all the phones on my desk here in front of me, I'll support some level of this. Um, sometimes you have to turn it on, so we have a troubleshooting uh, tool built into some of the, the, the phones that we can turn on syslog, we can turn on SNMP traps, but otherwise the phone doesn't bother anybody with such details. Um, so. Sometimes you do need to turn it on in the device. It isn't just doing it, but most importantly, you need a listener. So you need an application. These are three kind of famous names. You've got SolarWinds, Spiceworks, and, and What's Up. Um, I've used all three of them. Uh, Digicom uses SolarWinds on our platform. Spiceworks is amazing. I've used it. I find it really nice and easy to use. And What's Up, I know a lot of our customers use it. So um, these are tools that, that, of course, you pay for. And they're not for your phone system. They're for everything on your network. They can tell you. Um, your printer, for example, constantly wants to tell you about what's going on with it. And again, it can tell the uh, network monitoring software. And from that software, incidentally, not to sell it because we, we, don't, we don't sell it, but not to sell you on the idea too strongly, but from there you can configure alerts whereby it will bother you um, with details you know, when you ask it to. So for example, if printing was very important to your business, then anytime that a printer has an issue, um, it could tell this application, of course, your solar winds, your spice works, what have you. And then that program could be educated to send you an email to tell you when a certain severity is reached. So very neat, very, um, very proactive. Yes, it's reactive to the problem, but it's proactive in that your user's probably not aware of the problem yet. And yet you've, uh, you've got an email telling you about it. So do relevant devices show any alarms or alerts? So in phone system terms, we call everything alarms. I'm not sure where that came from but we call um, problems uh, alarms. And so when I log into uh, an Avaya IP office, for example, it lists all kinds of different alarms that have taken place um, since the last time that it was restarted. So again, if we've got problems with a couple of our stations or with their SIP trunk, or we believe that certain stations have been offline and come back online, those are the kind of alarms that that software that comes with the system will tell you. So I don't even really, in, in, at a theoretical level, I don't really need my my solar winds, my spice works, and so on, watching all the time when I have a phone system that does that kind of stuff for me. All right, are there any ways to check the ISPs or the ITSPs performance? So this is a big question mark. I really don't know the answer to that. Does Bell have, uh, if they're your ISP, do they have some method that you can log in and find out what your internet connectivity has been like if performance has failed in the last while? The reason why is um, because if we can line up performance degradation from the network, with the times that we had performance degradation on our phone calls, then, then we've really got something. And it, 
it won't necessarily, I don't think in my mind, you shouldn't skip all the troubleshooting um, steps when you find some of this stuff out. If the phone system tells you something or, or your circuitry tells you something, your ISP, that's great. But unless it's blatantly obvious, I think you should still go through the checks and balances. Nonetheless, it's nice to know. And lastly, uh, network monitoring software. So I don't know why that's fairly redundant. Solar winds, spice works, et cetera, are, are called uh, network monitoring software. So um, again, I'm, I'm not sure why I put that in there. Okay, so uh, there we go. So draw a circle and define and, and refine. So, and this is what we're about to do here. So initially any problem looks big. All right, so that's something like get that, uh, you know, put that on the table right now. That's normal. I've been doing this for a long time. When somebody calls me, uh, especially if they say I've had three other companies look at this, that's daunting. It's, you know, I'm mildly frightened, I guess. I don't, I don't know what the word is for it, but it, there's trepidation there because when they describe the problem, it looks enormous, but that's what every problem looks like. That's the way they all look. If it's a good problem, it looks big. Um, but then, you know, you, you realize after doing this a lot of times and following this approach that once you've collected enough data about it and you start sort of closing in on that circle, the problem very rapidly gets smaller. Quite often it gets smaller by like 50% in the first couple hours of effort. So you've already cut it way down. And then, and then from there on, you know, you, you go further, right? And sometimes it takes weeks, but, but, you know, that's usually on and off effort for a great deal of time while we slowly strategically um, take things off the table, right? We rule things out. So begin with identifying everything that could possibly be in the problem. And that's where basically you circle the entire picture. Okay, <laughs> that's where the circle starts. Then refine it by tackling elements um, one at a time. So, and this is where the tools come in there and we're gonna talk about those in a couple seconds. So until you have a narrow list of culprits, this is what you do is just slowly um, bring the problem down to some digestible size. And eventually, you know, we'll only have three things in the circle and we'll have some sort of a strategy for for ruling out two out of the three things and then we know the last thing left has got to be the problem. What exactly in there doesn't always matter. You know, I hate to say, but we are a, a replacement society at this moment. If, if it turns out, for example, that the phone is the issue at $200 a phone, um, guess what? You know, it's really not worth your time to try and figure out what might be wrong in the software, something that you're ill-equipped, I'm ill-equipped to figure out. Only an engineer who designed the darn thing might be able to figure it out. Instead, we take the component we RMA it or we set it aside and we replace it, right? So it's it's not my favorite method of troubleshooting, but that's the reality of it. Uh, quite often you get down to the stage where you know that it's one thing and it is a replaceable component. Okay, so here are the tools of the trade. So we talked about what we need to do. Well, the, the tools of the trade, the most important tool is your brain, right? It really is. It can quickly detect correlations. You know, you think about, uh, I was reading the, you know, the, the Deep Blue Kasparovsky, uh, you know, recount, because of course, it's a long time ago that computers were able to beat humans um, at logical games like chess, but the human brain is still far more sophisticated than that. And it can gather very unrelated looking or very unrelated seeming things and in a flash of brilliance, bring them together and you realize that one could have caused the other, or both of these things indicate that that, you know, the third element must be true. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So it's the most important thing. Problem is it tires easily, okay, and it does get into this where you end up um, going through the same kinds of checks or testing for the same thing more than once, even though you know that it isn't true anymore. And, and, um, and that's a problem. You got to check yourself, um, say once an hour and say, right, do I have any new ideas? Am I going in a systemic, um, you know, strategic approach here, or am I just trying stuff at random now? Because trying stuff at random, generally speaking, isn't worth the time. So it's also susceptible to recency bias, right? So you, I'm sure you've heard of that before or superstition, or gut instincts, and so on. And so you really need to hold yourself to, to good logical standards. You need to say to yourself, listen, that's, I, I know I have a feeling, and I maybe just to scratch the itch, I'll give myself five minutes to prove or disprove the feeling, that little hunch. But generally speaking, you should follow a strategy. And then lastly, or sorry, secondly, physical tools. So we got cable testers. So this right here, I grabbed out of a little bag that I've got. So. These, these here are an example of really inexpensive cable uh, testers. They kind of click together and then you put one on one end of the cable and the other on the other end of the cable. They've got these to go into the patch patch panel and to go into the wall. Okay, and uh, they can tell you all kinds of neat things on here. They can tell you, 
whether your, your pinout is good, whether they're reversed, uh, and whether you have an open or a short on any of those pins, right? So it's basically going to prove your, your wiring. Even if you have a patch cable and you suspect that it isn't any good, got a couple methods. One of them is the swap for good. Um, so that would be your sort of swap and pray methodology. That's fine. Um, and, and in some cases, that's all you can do. If you've got a tester, of course, you could plug the cable in and loop it right back around, turn this thing on, and should be able to flip it over and read and find out that it's okay. All right, so that's one of our physical testers. The other one is this guy here. It doesn't show very well because it's got post-it note on it, but notice my post-it note. That's kind of a lesson in itself. So um, the post-it note on it gives me the IP address of it, gives me the password of it, and it says that port one is for packets in and port eight is for packets out. So what this thing is, is just a little inexpensive gigabit eight port net gear switch. Happens to be a net gear GS 10, or sorry, 108E, uh, if you're interested, 108E. And what this is, is it's a port mirroring switch. Like it, it's a managed layer two switch. So in other words, you can log into it and you can tell it which ports, these are the ones I've got set up on it. And that's why I've got them written on it, just to save me I'm trying to remember. Um, you basically, you can make ports mirror. So you can plug your laptop then in, in this case, into port eight and listen to all traffic that comes in off of port eight. And it reflects whatever goes through port one and any other port on this switch. Okay. So I would lead my network into port one. So I might lead the, the switch that I'm trying to prove or disprove into port one and then uplink it from port two to maybe it's neighboring switch or the router or wherever it goes. So this guy ends up being in the middle. And then from the middle position, I end up listening to it on port eight. And I use an application like Wireshark, which will be on the next page it's mentioned. Okay, so I listen to a packet capturing software. I gather all those packets and I can go in and analyze them afterwards and see what was going on at the time that there was a, a problem, right? Uh, and further to that, you can listen to the voice call, right? Uh, 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 Wireshark has some really neat tools built into it. It will reconstruct the voice call. So if you have any, any doubts about the quality of the call, um, you can actually listen to it. So this thing here for 50, 60, $70 is not very expensive. Whatever it was is well under a hundred is well worth, uh, well worth the money. Okay. So that's a, uh, a great, uh, port mirroring switch is a fantastic thing to have around. And so, and, uh, but the above tools and techniques can be expensive. Yeah, sure they can be, right? If you're your core switch, to get port mirroring on a core switch, it's very expensive. And the technique of swap and pray, it's a good technique when it makes sense. So for example, if you've isolated the problem to one person's phone, and yet you've tested the cabling and it seems fine, um, for you to take that person's phone and swap it with another phone, you know, that's not very expensive, but for you to call up Digicom and buy another phone just for the sake of testing this out, um, that can be expensive, right? So, so most of these things, there's a, an expensive and a cheaper and more practical way to do it. Okay, and then lastly, the software tools. So, and let me uh, just show you very briefly some of them. So ping and ping utilities. Well, we all know what ping is. I'm not going to show you that. There's no need for that. But let me go tab, tab, tab. I'm going to show you this guy here. It's called FreePing. This thing I've been using for a long time. It's a great application. It's a company called Tools Forever. Um, they make a whole host of other applications now, I see. This was free at the time um, that I downloaded it, you know, a long, long time ago. Um, and I expect that it still is. It's a pretty rudimentary application, to be honest. But this guy here, um, you can, you can um, install it on a, on, on a computer on the LAN. Right on the voice land, if you've got a, a voice network planned, or or on the data land, if your if your phones, for example, or your phone system happen to be on the same network as everything else, that's fine too. And all this does is it pings at a host. Um, it could be inside or outside. Uh, 4.2.2.2, uh, let's do four two 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 for example, and we would name it, and we can decide on the packet size as well, right? So that it matches our our voice packet, our voice payload. And what it does is it gets fired up and it sends these pings to it and it gives you uh, statistics. So when you next log into it, this is not sophisticated. It doesn't email them to you or something like that. It just gets statistics for you and tells you what percentage of them were okay, what the maximum, minimum, and average delay was of the packet returning all the way back to you, right? So that's what it does. 
Now, why I like this thing is because in my mind, when I'm troubleshooting something, first of all, a ping is my favorite tool. It just typically, there we can see that it's green there now, there's a little check mark. Okay, it's just indicating that it's making contact. Um, but generally speaking, problems will be solved by ping, as silly as it sounds. Yes, you'll use trace route, et cetera, but typically it, it will find the segment of the network that's bothering you and, uh, and at least give you a head start. But the problem is you need an awful lot of, in order to trust your tool, the laptop itself that it's loaded on, you need an awful lot of tools, or sorry, you need an awful lot of points of reference. So we need to shoot at our router, we need to shoot at our, uh, potentially our, our VLAN gateway, um, at an adjacent phone, for example, an adjacent device. Um, the internet itself, like the, the public gateway of, of our internet provider, and then perhaps the SBC on the other side. So the actual VoIP provider, uh, you know, in some cases. So again, I will apply this in two seconds for you. Um, secondly, again, I find myself a bit of a rush here trying to do the impossible. Secondly, here we go, uh, is Wireshark, right? So Wireshark, we determine, and guys, believe me, there are entire courses on Wireshark for free online. There are ones too that you can pay and become Wireshark certified. This is a really neat tool, but for you or I, it's actually very simple. Uh, when we set it up to capture, you can see I'm showing you a capture right now. So this gives you an idea of some RTP traffic. So this is the actual voice payload of a phone call for a client that I was troubleshooting at some point, I believe a year or so ago. Um, and I can actually hit play on here. I, I won't, but I can hit play on here and you can listen to the phone call as well in order to hear um, where things were being disrupted. And then we will know, you'll notice that this is at 101.56. So on whatever the date was, I can then take a look at other aspects of the traffic that I've potentially also captured here on Wireshark to find out what was going. I can also look back to my free ping and say, well, free ping, you know, were we seeing a spike? Were we seeing a delay of packets getting back from things during that time period, right? So there's an awful lot of, you know, sort of correlation that we can get from Wireshark. Yes, we can troubleshoot signaling problems and stuff like that, fine. But for the purposes of our discussion right now, and that's probably what Wireshark's best at, but for the purposes of our discussion, um, it's really good at, at capturing that RTP traffic and helping you correlate exactly when the call went bad with some sort of a network event. All right, now let's go back to here. So we have ping, we have trace route, which of course, you know, trace route tells you all the different hops on the way between point A and point B. We've got monitoring and testing tools like Pass Solutions Total View. This is a really cool product. We don't sell it, so again, I'm not endorsing them any other than I'm, I'm telling you that it's a great product. I've used it. I've um, dealt with the people there. I met them at a trade show one time, and uh, it's an amazing solution. It just sort of gives you an overall um, health of your network. It costs money. It's, it's not cheap. It's not wildly expensive either. It's right in the middle uh, for, for the competitive products out there. Um, but it's great if you've got the kind of dollars to throw at that. Uh, it also, you know, will look after your network forever and ever. So it'll not only help you solve a problem when a problem occurs, but it will, you know, look at the health of your network all the time. So NetStat, if you've got a soft phone problem, I kind of put that in brackets, almost like an afterthought. It's not that it's super useful for us. Putty, of course, is because lots of things like this network switch. This switch has a, has a GUI on it. But if I really needed to get into the nitty gritty of it, um, most definitely I need to connect using PuTTY, right? Using Telnet or something to that effect, which of course is what PuTTY is good for. And then Wireshark uh, with a port mirroring switch. So the other you know, key tool as we discussed. So let's do it real quick here. Um, it's gotta be quick because we're already out of time. So uh, let's run through a couple of phantom scenarios. So the steps that we discussed were draw a diagram, collect user info, collect device info, draw some circles. And what we're gonna use is, of course, human brain, physical tools, software tools. And we're gonna do this all by, you know, creating this phantom scenario here. So let's take a look back at our map. I apologize for anybody who has to duck right out at exactly 2.30. I do have a poll, incidentally, so if you wanna stick around and tell us that it was rushed, you can. Um, oh, that's, that's really handy. All right, here we go. Sorry, I'm trying to find that work diagram. Ah, there it is there. So I hope you can see this. You don't really need to. I'm going to read out the, the details to it. And uh, honestly, it's not that important because it's all made up anyway. But let's say we have a problem. So take a look right here. Um, we've got a case where we have some switches down here. Let me see if I can get the pointer. Cool. Yeah, we got some switches down here at the main site. 
And let's say, so your, your common problem, if it's a remote user, let's be honest, we're probably accusatory about their remote setup right off the bat. And honestly, you can almost circle that right away. Um, that's a bit of a gut play, but it's, it's generally true. Um, but again, don't skip the other steps either, like your, your own internet, for example, at your building. But let's say in this scenario at the main site, um, one, of our, one of our users on one of these telephones here, it's an IP phone you can see connected to a network switch, they are having um, voice quality issues. So I would of course collect user info for the first, so the first thing I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna go back to that chart again, but I would give them something like that and say, listen, can you do me a favor and collect these details for me? Then I'm not gonna jump straight to Wireshark or something like that. It seems like an awfully big step to take. It's a little invasive. It's a bit of a pain in the butt right away. So let's sort of cross off the easy stuff as, as we can. So I'm gonna say to her, okay, so can you please collect um, as much info as you can? And in came the information in that format that we asked for. And uh, lo and behold, every time uh, that that person has a phone call, or sorry, not every time they have a phone call, but every time they have an issue, um, according to them, every time they have an issue, um, it seems to be an outside number. So we might say to them, all right, so do me a favor then just to, to prove this for me. Have you ever, ever had a problem with another person uh, in our office talking to them directly? And usually they'll say, well, yes. <laughs> and you say, okie doke, were you talking to them on their extension? Oh, no, no, they were on their cell phone. Ah, fair enough. So desk to desk phone. Have you ever, ever had a problem before? And if the answer is no, then in our circle, so where's our, our um, tools here? Gotta, gotta get rid of the pointer, I think. Where are, oh gosh, that's the other, just a sec here. I'm looking for this guy, there we go. Here's our annotate, very good. And there's our, sure, draw. So our circle, you know, that, that was the entire thing. Don't make me circle, right? And the entire darn thing was in the circle initially. Now the circle, we know that it's not, it's not phone to phone. So that's great news, right? So it's not phone to phone. So right now, be honest with you, this guy here in the entire circle of things, this guy here in my mind is out of the equation, right? Because it's not the network switch or this person here would have problems, okay? And they're not complaining. Like this person right here is complaining. That's, that's really it. So we go, okay, so now we can look at building wiring. So we could pull out the old, uh, this guy here, right? Could pull out our tester. Honestly, this is a really rudimentary tester. Like it's just basically connected or not connected. So it's probably not gonna do a lot for you. Um, so we could try and test um, by, we could ask the user to swip or to, to swip, to switch spots with the other user. We could, um, we could do a number of different things to try and test that, to rule that out. But if, if, other people aren't having the problem with their phone either. Then can we say then that the PBX itself, the IP office is likely off the hook in this case? Probably so, right? So the IP office is likely not it either. So let's eliminate that device too, because it's likely not it. Now I'm gonna log into the IP office though and find out. She, she made a list of all the phone calls that, that were poor quality. And I'm gonna find out when she picks up her phone and dials, uh, what route does it take? Does it go out our SIP trunks or not, right? Because if it goes out the SIP trunks, then we've got this whole other element to, to look at. Uh, if it goes out the PRI, then it's kind of easy street in the respect that the PRI goes into the IP office, right, into the into the PBX in this case. And so um, so we know that the problem is simply between the PSTN and, and that phone. Now you'd almost ask yourself, if nobody else is having problems, why is that? Are they all going out a different trunk? They're all going out SIP trunks or you know, are they going out the PRI, but they're not calling the same even area? Maybe it's a PSTN problem, right? There are a number of things that it could still be, but we're basically saying if one phone is plugged into the phone system and another phone is plugged into the phone system and one phone has a very different experience than the other, then it probably isn't the common element of the phone system. It's likely not. So regardless of what they say, whether it be a SIP trunk that, that the route takes or whether it's PRI, it's likely not that either, because then again, I'm very suspicious as to why nobody else has this problem, okay? Now, maybe that user does more volume on the SIP trunks than anybody else. Each time there's a problem, it's a SIP trunk problem, and just nobody else has noticed that, right? So there are possibilities, and that's why I always you know, remind you, correlation doesn't mean causation, right? There are two different things. A correlation is simply that, it's just a correlation, um, but it usually points in the right direction. So in this case, let's say, doesn't matter. Let's say it's SIP, doesn't matter. So it's SIP. 
So I would want to validate that. I would want to find out, is anybody else using the SIP trunks as frequently as this user? Because I still want to know why it is that this one person's having a problem and the other one is not, or the other few are not. So if I could collect that kind of information, I likely could collect it by asking other users, by going to a reporting package, by running um, a uh, sysmonitor application on the phone system itself and having it right to the file. And then I can go in and see all the phone calls that were made in a day and see how many SIP phone calls, for example, were made and what times of the day they were made at to, to sort of prove my point. At this moment, in this particular scenario, and I made it up as I'm going along, I'm actually surmising, as funny as it sounds, I am actually surmising that it has something to do with the phone. Because again, too many common elements. So the phone or possibly the wire or something like that, it really seems suspect. Now I've seen in cases before where the person, this is the only person in the office for whatever reason who doesn't believe in, in Wi-Fi on their laptop and they always take their laptop and they connect it to the back of the phone. And so the phone is overtaxed as compared to the neighbor's phones or the phone is overtaxed because of the type of work that this person does. They do a lot of CAD drawings and large files. And so that's the problem. Or we don't have VLANs enabled, right? So we're not in best practices at the moment. And so that's what's taxing the phone. So I have seen it before, but in this case, you almost wonder if it's the set. And so that sort of that swap and pray methodology comes in. We would say, okay, um, especially if the phones are hot desking, we would say, you know what, can we physically take your phone and trade it with your neighbors? People aren't always big on that. And by the way, um, if they use receivers or headsets, take the receiver off of each phone and swap it because people are weird about that. Um, and maybe they should be, right? They are holding it. It's fairly intimate to their face and make, of course, uh, sure that you swap their headsets. So the experience is the same. Speaking of headsets, does this person use a headset and other people don't? Have they tried the phone in any other way, right? Because right now we're kind of looking at this and we're, we've jumped right to the conclusion that it likely has something to do uniquely with, you, uniquely with the device itself. So now we're in a position to, to troubleshoot that one thing. So we've taken our, our huge circle and made it smaller. Likewise, let's go through one more quickie. Um, likewise, if we have a problem, if person over here has a problem in the remote office, and so person has a problem in the remote office every time they call out. So it's the same scenario as before really, but it's, it's at the remote office. We can't immediately jump on the internet connection at the remote office. I know that's usually they've got a lesser internet connection and so you're really tempted uh, to jump right on that, but that's not necessarily the weak, the, the weak link, right? I would want to, uh, I would want to get right in straight away. I usually try and try and get a PC there and I try and uh, do some pinging. So I would want to ping. I would want to, first of all, stick a PC onto the same network as the phones are. So I'd want to stick a PC there, laptop, something like that, that I borrow for a day or so, however long it takes uh, to do this. Pardon me. I would launch the free ping utility because I love the darn thing and it does a great job. And I would start pinging a few things. If it's this desk phone that's the problem, find out the IP address of that desk phone and use your free ping utility to start hammering it. Just all you are is you're just doing a free ping against it over and over and over again. It shouldn't burden it, not a big deal. Also, if this switch right here has an IP address attached to it, for some reason it's a managed switch, I want you to do that as well. All right, so these are all for points of reference and they take no time and they cost no money to do it, so why not? So I start hammering this switch as well. And then, um, well, we don't know, it could be our gateway, right? It could be this guy here, the router firewall. So I would hit the internal IP of this guy and then the external IP of this guy. So typically speaking, you know, each gateway, there are two addresses, right? So I wanna hit the LAN side and the WAN side. I have seen the odd case in which when you're poking away at the WAN side, you don't see drops, or sorry, you, you see drops at a different time than you do on the LAN side. So the LAN, in other words, behaves the way we think it would, probably under one millisecond, somewhere around there, definitely well under you know, five or, or 10, but it, it acts the way you expect it to, but then suddenly you actually note that the uh, IP attached to the WAN side seems to give up the odd packet. And then maybe it's overwhelmed, maybe the interface has an issue, whatever the case may be, Maybe it's all the logic that's going on inside the router itself that's taxing it because theoretically something that's right on the other side of the door really um, you know, shouldn't get, take any longer to get there than it does to, uh, to return a ping from the land side. So that's odd to see that. It's very rare, but I mean, it happens. 
Then the next thing I would want to do, so we've kind of talked about, um, right here we talked about our LAN IP. I would do the WAN IP of this guy as well. Then I would do the ISP gateway. So I'd start hitting that guy. And then lastly, I usually pick um, a device out on the internet. So I go with 4.2.2.1, something like that, that I know is sound as a pound. And I pick that as well, because if my router is dropping things, then the thing, the routers, or sorry, if my, my internet, my ISP gateway is dropping packets, then I'm not going to get there properly either. So it helps me further solidify my resolve. Likewise, though, if it's returning packets, so the ISP gateway is returning packets really nicely, and yet something that's trusted like 4.2.2.1 or 8.8.8.8 for Google, if something trusted like that is dropping them, then I know at least all the way to my ISP, things are going well, but they're not going well anywhere after that. Okay, so again, all I'm trying to do is, is take this enormous circle and rule some things out. And then last but not least, I got a VPN going through the public internet, going to my main site very likely. So here I could start hitting the outside of my gateway here. And that's really enough to give you a lot of intel right away. From here, because you control the main site as well, you could get something very similar going on on the inside. The inside, the things that you're wanna, going to want to hit are, so we set up our computer. Things you're gonna to wanna to hit are, once again, the switch if at all possible, the phone system itself, because that guy is the, the issue after all, so let's start hitting him. If he's dropping packets, then heavens, like the whole, the whole network might be great, and yet your phone system's actually letting you down. Again, it's very rare, but it can happen. Also, I want to hit the inside, so my, my internal, my LAN, and my WAN of my, of my main gateway. Oops, I'm drawing it on the modem, but you get the idea, right? So my LAN and my WAN, and then again, pick some point on the internet, your 4.2.2.1 or something to that effect. And again, let's see who lets you down. So when we find out, for example, that we're getting return packets from the, the phone system, it's good. We're getting good return packets from the switch, of course. That's how we got there in the first place. We, we look great. Our router firewall looks okay. The WAN side also looks okay. This guy here on this side, I found out that everything's tickety-boo. So let's just say right here, this entire thing can be ruled out. And this entire thing ruled out. But that, that same, that address way out in the in the ethers that 4.2.2.1 sitting way out here is dropping packets then I know that it's actually our ISP who's letting the process down somewhere along the way and it gives me somebody to call. Likewise if I find out that the LAN is not returning packets the way we expect it to or the WAN isn't then I know that my my router my firewall has an issue. So again if we've got enough points of reference and you know we use our, our brains um, we should be able to figure out what the correlation is and what we can eliminate. So again, we sort of take this enormous circle and we've decreased it by this and we've decreased it by that. And really all that we're circling now, and I know it's a, an awful circle to have the, <laughs> the public internet. There are many places where it can go wrong, but at least we have evidence that that's where the problem is. And most importantly, we don't waste our time tracking down problems that don't exist on our LAN or on a remote site and tell people, gosh, you need better internet at the remote office. I'm sorry, that's the, that's the end of story because you guys are the only ones complaining, right? Because that would be the scenario here, would it not? And yet that isn't the problem, right? It isn't their office. So I, I hope that there's some value to this, guys. I'm just, um, I'm gonna have to wrap things up because um, that's kind of the way it goes. So I'm gonna wrap things up here. Uh, first of all, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, and secondly, I am gonna bring up a poll here real fast, polls and launch polling and allow panelists to vote. There we go. So I'll launch some polling there. Again, I know um, I know it's an awful lot to take really quickly. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm sorry that I kept you an extra 15 minutes. <laughs> if I didn't keep you the extra 15 minutes, I honestly don't know how we could have got through it. So, um, so please uh, go ahead, fill out the poll. If you got any questions real quick there, I'm happy to take them. Uh, please just type them in the chat window. I'll read them out to everybody and, uh, and I'll try and answer them for you. Um, and otherwise, you know, thank you very much for your time. Again, um, we appreciate it. We hope to continue to add value uh, to you and uh, continue to add these, uh, these webinars. So thanks very much for your time.